Hey guys, this is your girl Melanie and I told you before I was going to bring you a video. I did this review um, quite some months back. It may have been, I don't think it's been a year, but this is basically explaining what is going on globally with the political divide between men and women and why women are leaning left and men are leaning right. And um, last night there was a, um, a on Twitter, there was a, a, a call that or I kept seeing um, white women was trending and I couldn't understand why. So I checked it out and it seems as though there was a Zoom call. Like if you, you've heard about, there was a Zoom call of 40,000 black women and then a Zoom call of 20,000 black men. I can't, you know, these, they, when they say that it's a call, it's basically a webinar that people log into. It's not a Zoom call. It's just over Zoom, the webinar is held and people log in for it. So they held it and it was for white women now. Now I will say it's woke white women who did this, it's not all white women, liberal women. And it was in support of Kamala Harris. It's the same coalition that got behind Hillary Clinton for her 2016 bid for president. So you're not gonna see men do that for the most part. In fact, the backlash I saw were men of all races um, if any men were supporting Kamala in the comments or saying, you know, they, they wish they could do one. They were just, there was a lot of talking about, does he actually have all his anatomy? He's a simp, he's a wimp, he's a whatever. And this is where I'm hearing a lot of chatter where men are just like, if you, you know, are just dogging out other men who are in support of Kamala Harris and basically saying he is basically a cuckold and all of that. And women on the other side are saying, any men that are saying that they're misogynistic and they're blah, blah, blah. But that's indicative of what is going on in the world today. It's indicative of what's going on on social media at large. There is a great divide between men and women. I've cut my teeth, I keep telling you guys, in the dating and relationship space. And that's where I first was introduced to the huge gender war that is going on in this country. And not just this country, this is gonna show you how it's global, but we'll continue with the video and then I'll just inject some of the information that I have learned that will add to this and give you a greater vision of, of what's going on, um, not just in, you know, like the dating world, like I said, in relationship space and what's in, and economically, but how this is going to greatly impact the 2024 election and why you're going to see more men are going to roll with Donald Trump and more women are going to roll with Kamala Harris. And it is because they're, that's a man and that's a woman, but it's even deeper than that. So Twitter has been obsessed with this graph from data journalist John Byrne Murdoch at the Financial Times, which apparently illustrates the growing political divide between young men and women in several developed countries. And it's triggered a furious row on social media, with the right blaming the new gender gap on what they see as excesses of identity politics and modern feminism, and the left blaming it on what they see as toxic masculinity and a reactive anti-feminist misogyny. So, in this video, we thought we'd take a look at the growing gender gap and the data behind it some of its potential repercussions, and finally offer some tentative explanations for what might be causing it. Now, the first thing we need to say is that while we're obviously grateful to John Byrne Murdoch for drawing attention to the phenomenon, the Financial Times aren't the first to notice that women are becoming more liberal than men. The so-called gender gap was first observed in the late 90s and early 2000s, when academics started noticing that men were no longer more left-wing than women. Yep, you heard that right. While it might be hard to believe today, until the 80s and 90s, men tended to be more left-wing than women. In the US, for example, women historically voted Republican, but started moving towards the Democrats from the 1980 election onwards. In fact, you can kind of see this in the FT graph, where the blue line starts off slightly higher than the red one. While in the UK, young women suddenly veered towards Labour at the 1992 election, while young men did the opposite. This gender gap, where men were more liberal than women, and which lasted from the end of World War II until the 80s, is known in the literature as the traditional gender gap. Conversely, the gender gap we see today, where women are more liberal than men, is known as the modern gender gap. But while the modern gender gap has existed for the past 30 years or so, 
That piece in the FT suggests that it's widened significantly in the past few years with Gen Z. Now, because much of the data involved essentially uses party affiliation as a proxy for ideology, it's hard to say whether this is because young women are getting more liberal or young men are getting more conservative. For instance, while at first glance the graphs apparently suggest that it's mainly women getting more liberal, with the notable exception of South Korea, it could instead be argued that women have stayed the same, but conservative parties have moved right and taken young men with them. Which would mean even more women voting for liberal parties, even if their politics haven't changed. Anyway, whether it's men moving right or women moving left, it's at least true to say that the gap between the two sides has widened according to recent data. In this sense, there are now three gender gaps. The traditional gender gap running from World War II until about 1980, when men were more liberal than women. The modern gender gap running from 1980 until about 2020, where women were more liberal than men. And what we might describe as the Gen Z gender gap, which began a couple of years ago and refers to the fact that young women are now much more liberal than young men. While now, what he's explaining, and he keeps saying that the, you're seeing this new gender gap happening, this Gen Z gender gap, it, the result of it is, it's a number of things, um, and he doesn't really get into it, but the what you see is it is identity politics. And this is what the, you know, there's a lot of research gone into each political party on how they're gonna market and how they're gonna garner a base and what are the hot button issues overall that will move their base. And what we've seen with the influx of social media, if you go on there, it has been traditionally a left-leaning liberal paradise. We talk about Me Too, when you talk about you know, the conversations about how women are not getting paid as much as men, which is a myth that has been debunked. When they say that, you know, women are oppressed or the patriarchy, you saw that those words like that and phrases like that have become more mainstream. Even though when you point to where are women oppressed in the workplace, where has the patriarchy hurt a Gen Z woman today? Well, then they say, you know what? It's not that it's just today. It's just a male structure. The world was, you know, structured in a for, for men, it's the same way where you will see a lot of black um, activists to say, well, the world was structured for white people. So therefore it is a white supremacist structure. So the patriarchy is thinking of it as a male supremacist structure. And so because that structure exists, it needs to be torn down. There's not true equality until women can actually not only tear down the patriarchy in this male supremacy structure, but rebuild it in the name of womanhood, in the name of women, in a way that women will find more appealing that suits women. So it's not enough to have equality because equality, it, it, it only means well, we're now equal within a male supremacy. Okay. We're in a, we're still in the male supremacy structure. If we tear down that structure, we'll then rebuild it in womanhood. Well, now it's men's turn to live in this female supremacy structure. And we are seeing this happen across the board in every facet of life. You see it in the schools, uh, college campuses and universities, which are just indoctrination havens for liberalism and the female supremacy um, archetype. Me Too was one of the biggest movements to help catapult that as well, um, where it really tried to bring out the sins of some men or it was turned into, well, it's institutionalized sin as a whole in this male dominated structure. So that needs to be torn down. Were you taking individual issues and then anecdotal evidence that, oh, well, it's everywhere and everything needs to be reformed and it needs to be safe spaces and it needs to be all of that. And so corporations, women are the biggest buy consumers in our market. We drive the market in terms of, you know, we, we buy everything. We are the biggest spenders. We have the largest amount of debt compared to men. And so corporations respond well. They don't want to lose their customer base. I mean, all of this is driven by money, just so you know as well. So, and because of that, well, we've got to pander, we've got to please, we've got to show change. We've got to, we've, we've got to bend the knee essentially to what seems to be an overwhelming backlash or overwhelming need for women to rise up. And so in order to do that, we have to purposely 
promote and to create things that are specifically led for women that boxes men's men out. And so women are seen as needing to be a protected class, although women are, or as a minority group, but women are actually the majority in the United States. They are not a minority. So men are actually technically should be the protected class. But again, because we live in a patriarchal, you know, cis supremacy, a male supremacy system, well, and, and traditionally men have, you know, have had all the rights and women were oppressed in this patriarchy, patriarchal system. Well, now we have to turn that over in order to pe appease these customers, in order to retain customers in order to get new customers and to not receive any backlash because social media at the time of of canceling people are we're past i think we're past the era of canceling at this point but at the time the canceling of 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 uh, of individuals and corporations it had a huge effect on the bottom line we've seen that on the left and the right when you see when budweiser when when bud bud i think it's budweiser bud light i don't know the difference between the two they were <laughs> they were canceled because using dylan mulvaney and on the other side there's countless number of things we look at johnny depp who was canceled because of me too and amber heard and all of that but it usually takes years before any of that is sorted out if ever so a lot of companies are fearful they're going to lose their bottom line and most of these companies are led by men but they're not loyal to manhood or to other men they're loyal to the bottom line to their company to making profits and so you see a push in corporations where you know it's programs and other things and even with the secret service what they say they hired kim cheeto because they're trying to you know it essentially is dei this is where they came up with the dei a woman in a place that a man traditionally held that job and because we just need to see change there needs to be movement for women and rather it doesn't matter how qualified that person is we need that person in that job because it it is a figurehead it is a signal of tearing down of that patriarchal structure right and and to show that we are promoting equality and it doesn't matter what the qualifications, the optics are the main thing that are important in this type of thinking. And so then the Secret Service also wanted 30% more women by 2030 to be, I mean that the Secret Service be made up of 30% of women by 2030, it, just because they're women without actually asking deep questions, can women are actually, women have the physicality to guard and to be you know to have that type of role when it has been proven over and over women do not have the same physical strength or the same type of mentality when it comes to those type of jobs but again to even bring that up that logic is seen as sexist so it doesn't matter where you go with it even logic now is seen as sexist logic can be seen as racist logic so it's all these slurs and things and people have and companies in particular who have pushed this in social media that anything that goes against this narrative to re to rebuild society and a female structure is is you are part of the patriarchy you're going to be demonized you're going to be stigmatized you're going to be told you know you are wrong and really seen as bad so it doesn't it doesn't logic is not is not at play and so when they come back to liberal policies liberal agendas and conservative policies policies and conservative agenda you have the far left you have the far right you have just the left and right and you have kind of you know the central the people that try to make more compromise but what you see the most pulling on it is going to be the far extremes of both sides of this argument and the far extremes play more and more into emotions when it comes to women and more logic when it comes to men to the point where emotions are not counted at all so hopefully that that explains that and that's why a lot of women are you know that's where you're hearing misogyny I never heard that word used so much in my life, but anything that goes against a woman is coming against the tearing down of the patriarchy, the male supremacy structure, and goes against women. It is seen as misogyny because you just want to keep oppressing women so they can bring in. It doesn't matter if it's not if it if what the person is saying is logical, it's not really offensive. Well, I can take offense because the agenda is to push women forward. And if you have anything, even if it's logic. That, that, that stops that or blocks that or says it's wrong or or has a different thing or doesn't make me feel good the way this messaging does, the way these things do, anything that doesn't make me feel good, 
Okay, it's a lot of feelings based on the liberal side. If it makes me feel bad, well then it's hurtful, it's harmful. You even see the policing of words. Words are violence now. So if the words don't make me feel good, if it doesn't feel safe, if it, if it, it even if it's logic, <clears throat> then I can accuse, <clears throat> sorry, I can accuse you of being part of that patriarchal structure. You're a misogynist, you're all of that. But if you agree with me, well then, you can be part of it. So this is where, I hope I'm explaining this. <laughs> Am I woman-splaining? Am I man-splaining? I don't know what I'm doing. But I'm just trying to give you, trying to educate people on what is going on. And this is in no way even as in-depth as it should be. But this is just like top-line things I'm thinking to help you understand where this divide is coming from and why the the it has it is all set up by design to separate men and women and to, you know, and especially with the left, they have purposely tried to tear away women from aligning with men on any issues and creating women as the head of households, women driving the economy, women doing things because they can play more on women's emotions and feelings and get them to do things and to buy things and to, and to support things based on how they feel in the moment and not necessarily what is good overall. And this is again, why women spend the most and why we're the most in debt, because it's about what makes us feel good in the moment that experience. We are definitely chokeholded as women into, you know, <clears throat> into <laughs> overspending and all types of things. But that, that, that psychology that goes in with that fits very well with feeling baits, feeling based um, ideologies and feeling based politics. Inferring causation is difficult here. It's plausible that this widening gender gap could have some pretty severe social consequences. For instance, some commentators have suggested that this widening political chasm could be contributing to declining marriage and fertility rates in the developed world. As South Korea's gender gap has widened, its marriage rate has declined, and it now has the widest gender gap and the lowest fertility rate in the world. But what actually explains this gender gap? Well, while there are obviously a whole load of factors, research suggests that the most significant factor in the modern gender gap was actually secularization. In the 20th century, conservative parties like Christian democratic parties in Europe had strong links to the Catholic Church, while liberal parties were generally more atheistic. So as women were more religious than men, and religion is a key determinant of voting behaviour, perhaps unsurprisingly, women voted more conservative. While women are generally still more religious than men, the decline of religion and its strength as a determinant in voting behavior meant that women shifted left in the latter part of the 20th century. Religion might also partly explain the Gen Z gender gap. General social survey data from America suggests that in the last couple of years, young women have suddenly become less religious than young men for the first time in post-war history. Let me just quickly add, I know I talked a long time, but that's, that's what this is. Um, that is another component of it is because religion is seen as patriarchal where men are generally, especially in the Catholic and Christian faith, which is led in the, which are the main religion religions in the West, where men are seen as the head of the household, the head of things, men lead, men are on top. It, these are the principles that are taught biblically. And so there has been a tearing away of biblical principles <clears throat> or tearing uh, it, women moving away from it because it doesn't support the same message. It, it, it goes against the idea of the female supremacy, the, the female um, uh, structure in society. And so when you go into a thing and, you know, God is seen as the father and the son and the Holy spirit, it's the, these male pronouns, it's a male dominated religion. And so when you are fed a diet in society and social media, that women equality and women, 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 and anything that goes against it is wrong. Well, you're going to see even young women who have raised religiously to be turned off by religion because it's, it's still, it's seen as a misogynistic control device over women. Same thing with their bodies and their choices because religion comes against a woman having control over her own body. And you can see all of these things go hand in hand. They're tandem as to why we are seeing what we're seeing in the, in the data today. There are also clearly case specific reasons for this too. 
South Korea's gender gap, for instance, seems to be closely related with the fact that South Korea is one of the most culturally conservative countries in the world, with a higher than average fraction of men saying that women shouldn't work, and one of the worst work environments for women globally. While in Europe, some of the Gen Z gender gap seems to be partly driven by contrasting views on immigration. More generally though, commentators often point to the polarizing and radicalizing effects of social media or the increasing salience of cultural issues like feminism and identity politics. While these explanations might be intuitively plausible to some viewers, they're hard to actually prove with data, so we're not going to go into them in too much depth. However, one related and data-driven explanation is education. Women today often spend more years in education than men, and education has become an ever more important determinant of voting behaviour, especially in the US and UK, where one of the best indicators for liberal voting intention is whether or not you went to university. Finally though, one other explanation could be that the Gen Z gender gap just doesn't exist. For starters, it doesn't actually show up in other data sets, like the Cooperative Election Study or the General Social Survey. Now, to be fair, the Gallup polling used in the FT does have a larger sample size than the GSS and a lower non-response rate than the CES. But even then, some commentators have suggested that this data overstates the Gen Z divide by focusing more on how men and women identify politically rather than actual policy preferences, i.e. the difference between what's known as symbolic ideology and operational ideology. For evidence of this, take a look at this 2008 paper, which suggests that while younger generations of women are increasingly likely to vote or identify as left-wing than their male counterparts, the gap between them on actual policies and values remains pretty consistent. Data from 2020 suggests that something similar is true for Gen Z. While young women are far more likely to identify as left-wing, when you ask them about actual policies, the difference between men and women is pretty minor. And, and this is what I mean. It's all the top line messaging. And this is why we don't really get into depth and in policy. And you'll see this with uh, Kamala Harris and what's going on because she is no longer an old white man. And she is now a younger, she's, I, and people always say she's not black. She's not black. I just have to say that because that, that's the top line of what people say. Black woman and it's seen, okay, once she's a woman, she has a vag. So that, 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 that is going to sway on emotions. Then we have, you know, she's black. She's a minority group, a protected class, which is the, you know, the liberal policies are all about trying to supposedly promote that, or they've made, they've, you know, deepened the, the racial war, the gender war on their side. So those are things that sway emotion. And then what do you hear about Donald Trump from that side? It's all about, he's a, he's a rapist. He's had, um, 34 felonies. He said this and he said that, and he's just a, he's just a racist. He's just a bigot. He's these top line things that actually don't go into policy. They don't actually say, okay, what are the policies that affect your life? What, are, what do you think about this issue, this issue, this issue, this issue? They don't have to go into that because the top line messaging are designed to sway emotions. And what do women respond to the most? Emotional messaging, emotions, the liberal things that will be about emotions. So if you say, but gas prices were better under Trump. Sorry, I got an eyelash right there. Gas prices were better under Trump but I don't care. It, it, uh, I vote blue anybody who he's, he's a misogynist. Um, you know, uh, the economy was doing better. You had more money in your pocket. Well, uh, you know, I'm sorry. I, it, it, he is just, you know, he is a racist. Like even then when you ask people will point out where he has been racist, what he's done is racist. What are his racist policies? What is that? Well, one time he said, you know, bringing over the Mexican border, they, they're bringing their rapists and all these other things and they're committing crimes. Even if that can be shown true with some of the crimes that we've seen with the open borders policy, well, it, it, even if you bring logic that if, once you capture someone emotionally, it's very hard to break anything logically. Okay. And, and I would say, you know, the same could be said on the right, 
but it's less so there are some things where they'll say <clears throat> a person who is you know who who doesn't like black people well then they're going to want to go right and that's their emotional thing but that is few and far between these are anecdotal things i would say the larger bigger swath of or the, the bigger share of the liberal messaging is all playing on emotions and when the person is locked in emotionally into something that's it you you logic will not break through at all and this is why they know what they can do and this is why kamala harris actually has the opportunity to beat trump because you can never downplay how much an emotions based um messaging especially if it's beat through the media beat into beat like a drum in the media constantly kamala is transformational and she's doing this and then you have celebrities and you have all of this and it just feels good it feels nice and then the right will try to fight back with well policies and this and that and the other and these points and it's really a hard messaging to get through because again you're caught up in the moment it is not going to be until down the line when policy when the emotions have released and calmed down the honeymoon has settled down and then policies are affecting your life negatively that's when you see someone turn on a politician or turn on a party but by then it's too late we see this clearly with the sanctuary cities where <clears throat> black people overwhelmingly live in, in 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 cities and liberals live there white liberals and they vote in politicians who are liberal who support the sanctuary cities. sanctuary cities sound great on paper it sounds you know kumbaya and 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 it's not fair that these people and they just want to make a way and this that and the other but they don't logically think through okay my tax dollars and how if they start pouring in illegally it's going to affect my community. Crime is going to go up. We're going to get less services. And it is until they feel the effect of that emotional choice, the consequences of it, when they finally feel that effect, that's when they're just like, they start to lash out. You should see the town hall meetings coming against Mayor Brandon Johnson in Chicago about these liberal policies and having these illegal immigrants coming in there. And now black people are like, how could you do this? You're nothing but a, a house coon and you're all, they call him all types of names and they're taking away from this and taking away and doing that. But then these same people don't look in the mirror and say, I voted for this. I emotionally voted for this. I wanted this. It sounded good on paper, but the practicality and the day to day and the consequences I, I didn't even, I didn't realize it would affect me in that way. And now that it has, I'm having buyer's remorse. I'm having regret. I'm having, I'm waking up from the one night stand and now I have to do the walk of shame. It hasn't grown significantly between generations. All in all, the Gen Z gender gap is of course worrying, but it is worth interrogating the data before adding it to our ever growing list of societal catastrophes. While you've been watching this video, you might not realize that shady Okay, they're getting into an ad for their thing. But yeah, so I hopefully that explains this um, in greater depth for you. And you can, you know, let me know in the comments what you think about it. If you like for me to do these type of explanation videos, um, there's, I have quite a bit. This is how I used to do things a lot, um, just explaining and breaking things down in this type of way. Again, guys, I'm independent, but, and, but I'm one of the, and people can't believe that I'm independent. I'm not pro-Trump. I'm not pro- I don't know, Biden, I Kamala Harris, I don't even know what I'm, what's over there at this point. I am for what makes sense logically in terms of my life, my goals, where I see the country's going, what policies, you know, that affect me and not just jumping on a bandwagon because, or, you know, there's a lot of pressure to jump on a bandwagon and stick to it. But as an independent thinker, as an independent voter, I just can't do that. If I happen to vote left, it's because I'm believing in the policies or, 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 or you know, left. If I vote right, well, then that's because I believe in the policies. I don't follow a cult of personality. And I think more and more we live in an era where everything is about a personality or a person or you think a person is going to save you or a person is going to do this that and the other you see this on, on you know in politics today but i will tell you making sure that you think through what are the policies where where do you want the country to go where the, the where are the ways that the where is the country going currently that you don't like you know and having to weigh these things out but it takes 
more nuance. It takes more time. It takes a lot of thinking to do this. And today's voter in the West just doesn't do that. And I will say we are seeing even with Kamala Harris, people have turned completely off from the left. Biden's numbers were low because not just because it was just before the debate, you know, he was unpopular because his policies were unpopular. His policies were unpopular, but now I see what Kamala Harris is coming. She's black and she's a woman. Celebrities like her. So who cares what I was talking about before and what I felt about the economy and what I felt about the border and illegal immigrants and all of that. They just jump on the bandwagon because it's just that top line emotional circle jerk. And that's more than enough to just, and then you get the same results. And so this is where people are, you know, or the other side will say, well, Trump has convictions and Trump is this and Trump is that. And he's bad. He's bad. He's bad. Him, the person, they don't even, you get into policies. They don't even know what policy, they don't even know how to list policies. It's all personal. It's all emotional, emotionally based. And we've got to move away from that. But sadly, I just don't think the country will, especially with the divide between men and women. And you saw there exactly why it's happening. So um, this election is going to get spicy. We'll see what happens. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. And I'll see you on the next one.